From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, uh, check the show notes. No complaints. We talk about baseball for the first 35 minutes or so because they're 18-0. and 0. It's the best start in nearly 20 years. Forcing the football. Some spring themes we're looking for as we speak to Coach Norvell later today. And the best course of action for Florida State in handling the head basketball coaching situation. Wake Up Poor Champ presented by Corner Pocket Barn Grill, Tallahassee, Florida, 2475 Appalachian Parkway. CPTallybar.com, T-A-L-L-Y. Some people out there, Corey, spell it T-A-L-L-I. Like, yo, Aslan, what's up? Are you still in tally these days? Mm, T-A-L-L-I. Why? Why would you do that? Very strange. Lunch specials, Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., only $8.99. Incredible. Usually $12.99, but today from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., get a half-pound Black Angus burger, top shelf, everybody. Lettuce, tomato, and onion, and a side dish of your choice, straight fries, curly fries, onion rings, potato salad, coleslaw, broccoli, side salad, tater tots, fresh cooked potato chips, only $8.99 at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill in Tallahassee, Florida. You can always hit the QR code on your screen. That's the funky-looking barcode on your monitor, screen, whatever you're watching this show, ingesting, digesting it with, takes you right to the website. You can place your order to go as well. Uh, corner pocket, the best, the best. March Madness, go check the games out there. No March Madness for the Knowles basketball, but Warchant.com still going to be busy because football starts this week, everybody. Spring football. We speak to Coach Mike Norvell and all the coaches later today, so hop over to Warchant.com. We'll distill everything down. Be a subscriber. Hit a five-star rating and review for us as well, and the thumbs up, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Corey Clark in attendance, per usual. That's how it works this show. It's two of us that do it. Some of us carry more weight than the others. You determine who does what. What's up, Corey? What's up, buddy? How are you doing? Well, man, I'm glad to see you. Glad that you're back in the Hassie, uh, T-A-L-L-A Hassie. Uh, how was the weekend, man? The first weekend back in Tallahassee as a, a wed man. Been a long time since you could say that. It had been, man. It had been uh, well. It had been two weeks since the wedding, and it had been, uh, Lord, ten years, nine mm. years since uh, the last time I was a married man living in Tyler. I'm not batching it up anymore. <laughs> um, so I had to make a lot of unpleasant phone calls the last couple weeks. Oh, let people down <laughs> hard. You know, let them down. Let them know what was happening. No, that's obviously a joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was good. I got to. Uh, I hadn't. Florida State baseball was sixteen and zero, and Corey Clark had not covered a game through the first 16 games because wedding planning or wedding wedding weekend or being up in Atlanta with Brady. So I had not been able to cover a game. And then, uh, yeah, I went and covered Saturday and Sunday and they almost lost both of them. Mm. But you know what, Aslan? They didn't lose. They did not. They're 18 and zero, which is just insanity. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it was a good weekend overall. Got to uh, see some old friends and uh, watch some baseball wins. You were super eager to cover the games, which if, you're some of the uninitiated to this podcast. Again, leave a five star rating review. Welcome. Thank you. Thumbs up. But Corey, you know, Corey sometimes might think he's larger than the story itself. Like Corey thinks that he his actions, his presence alone can shift how mm. professional athletes and even semi professional athletes perform and play games. So I was like, I'm going to go to the game Saturday and Sunday because I feel like Corey's going to not want to be the guy that goes and covers Florida State baseball until they lose because you don't want to yeah. be present for the game and then have to take accountability for that. But right. I'm glad to see that you jumped at both games and it worked out. Um, I was a sweating too a close. little bit. Well, I, Sunday, I was Sunday a little too close for comfort. Come on. Both Link. of them were. Neither one of them were. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, all I, I've been watching ESPN Plus or ESPN 3, whatever we're supposed to call it now, yeah. and Florida State's always up 11-4. to 4. But when Corey goes to a game, it's uh, 4-2 with the tying run at second on Saturday, and then it's 4-3 on Sunday. But, uh, yeah, man, hey, they won. They they survived the Clark, the Clark jinx. Uh, the offense did not, but the pitching and defense did. And how about this, Aslan? They played four games this weekend. Obviously, they went – or this week. They obviously went 4-0 because they're 18-0 on the season, so they went 4-0. Didn't commit an error all week. Four straight games without an error. Yep. That's a, that's a good way to when your offense isn't clicking necessarily. That's a pretty good way to go ahead and uh, 
and uh, you know, win a game anyway. Listen, I didn't start paying attention to Florida State baseball until I enrolled at Florida State, so it was kind of like the end of that mega dynasty run that, that 11 had so you know early 2000s early aughts or whatever and even then were you paying attention in march like trust me folks i i know that uh that it's march whatever it is march 18th, 18th. as you're listening to this yeah, yeah I, it's not i know you're not locked and loaded especially with spring football coming up on college baseball we wouldn't normally lead the show with college baseball but florida state is 18 and 0 mm-hmm. after the worst season in school history so that's why it's leading the show. But go ahead, Aslan. I'm sorry. Well, I don't apologize for it either. There's a lot of people that are like, I feel like you guys are apologizing for talking about baseball. Please don't. We'll, we we like to listen to it. Yeah, man, we'll talk football here in a little bit. And then the rest of this week, I think we'll back to five shows a week. Um, so, yeah, there's no need to feel guilty about it. Yeah. And I probably wasn't paying attention to it in March, core, But I feel like even though that year they won 60 games in 2002 and they end up losing to Notre Dame in the Supers game three yeah. here in Tallahassee. Big time bummer. Um, and then towards the end, even when 11 got the thing back on track and was making it to Omaha every three years or so, which is something I think everybody could kind of live with, they never felt dominant and I don't want to say invincible, but just dominant, you know? And and I, I feel like what this team is now were probably those teams in the 90s, like that level of, of confidence, of just execution, because to your point about them playing clean in the, in the field, the starting pitching, I mean... I love the fact they're letting these guys dip close to 100 pitches. I mean, obviously they're they're throwing good stuff to be able to last that long, but there there hasn't been any quick hooks. Connor Whitaker worked out of some jams on Sunday. I think that that double play they turned in the fifth inning really kind of changed everything in the top half, and they were able to get some runs. I think played in the bottom half of that inning. But man, they're cleaning the field. They have really good starting pitching. I know they're still trying to figure out everything in the bullpen, but those guys are coming in in high leverage situations Saturday and Sunday and delivering. And I know the offense didn't hang double digit runs this weekend, but man, like Cam Smith is still a special dude. Uh, Din just hits the freaking cover off the ball. Uh, yeah. Can two had a really good game on Sunday. Like there's there's that revolving cast of guys outside of the Tibbs Ferrer, Cam Smith reliability factor that, that those guys are just going to be able to pick the other guy up, and, and, and it makes you feel good about this team. But any concerns about them hovering in the fours on Saturday and Sunday offensively? I mean, that, that might not be the the magic winning recipe in May and June, but or, or are you just taking it for the fact that man they're they're playing better competition and they're winning and that's all that matters right now because it's March. Yeah, there's two ways to look at it, right? Like the one hand, if they would have beaten every, if they would have won every game twelve to two, um, you'd feel like, oh man, this is a this is a juggernaut. This literally might be the best offense they've ever had in the history of the school. Um, so that didn't happen. So that can give you cause for concern. It's like, oh, okay, there's been an uptick in pitching, and now all of a sudden uh, you're only scoring, what, 16 runs for the series. You're averaging 36 runs every three games, and in this one you scored uh, you know, ha- less than half of that now that you're facing ACC pitching. Maybe the lineup isn't what we thought. And obviously the lineup is not going to average 12 runs a game. We, we knew that. We knew it was going to come back down to earth. But, um, so that, that's one way to look at it. It's okay, the offense isn't as good as we thought. Man, I was at those two games on Saturday and Sunday. They hit in horrible luck. Uh, Dinja, uh, uh, Dinges. Dinges, I, I mean, he must hit five balls, just lasers. are Right at people are caught on the track. Um, Max Williams had two or three just ri- – ri- he had like 111 mile an hour out um, <laughs> twice. He, uh, They just had – they hit some really bad luck. They had a couple of chances to blow the game open both days. Tibbs lined into a double play. Ferrer grounded into a double play. And then they had to hang on. So, on, on the one hand, you're like, okay, you could maybe take a step back and go, okay, this offense isn't just a, a, a freight train. But on the other hand, the, the what makes you excited about it is that I, I didn't know this team could win a game or win a series where they scored eight runs the last two the two games. They scored eight runs combined in two games and won them both. Yep. And they did it because on Saturday their pitching was dominant. And on Sunday, I think they only had four strikeouts as a pitching staff, but they made every play in the field, including turning two key double plays, picking two guys off the – they just – they did everything right. They they played a clean game. And you have to – in baseball, you're going to hit – you're going to have games where you hit in a bad luck or you hit it right at them or the other team has a really good pitcher too. And you have to win games uh, – different ways. You can't just bludgeon teams to death. And uh, they showed they could do that on Saturday and Sunday. Now, the the task gets tougher 
this weekend when they have to go at Clemson. They, they can't go to Clemson, I don't think, and score four runs on Saturday and Sunday each and win those two games. I mean, they're going to have to uh, put, put some runs together and some big innings together. But, yeah, man, I, I just think that it shows that they – we knew they had a couple of good pitchers. I feel like they have more good pitchers than we, we thought. And also, this defense is for real. Mm-hmm. It's a good defense. It's not an it's not an incredible, unbelievable defense, but it is a good defense, and you can win games with pitching and good defense, even when your offense is hitting into bad luck or or just not having a good game. So that that I thought, I thought that was encouraging, honestly. Yeah, it was encouraging to see them win win two close games, and win two games where the offense didn't just hammer the other team to death. Yeah, I like I, I like how you're pointing that out because, especially about the the bad luck sort of outs they had because. There's not the bad strikeout. There isn't the, you know, harmless pop up. Like even their, I know they're outs nonetheless, but yeah. they're loud, long outs, and it's like, man, they're they're that close from finding a gap, or they're that close from making it over the second baseman's head and being an extra base hit. Um, and, and over the course of a season, like law of averages, it's going to work out in their favor. Um, as you said, though, things get maybe a little bit interesting this weekend. Taking on Clemson, they're currently seventeen and two on the season. Their RPI is second. Uh, 32nd in batting average, Florida State is second. Uh, they're slugging 33rd in the country, Florida State fourth. Um, right. I don't have everything here side by those side. Are not, those probably aren't up to date either, are they? I mean, it's on the NCAA's websites, and they they actually they have the the finals here from the Duke game that the, the Duke series they played. So I'm assuming that if they've got the final scores listed, they're, oh, okay, they're maybe yeah, maybe they update them as they they go. I just always assume they did it overnight uh, as they waited for the West Coast games. But yeah, either way, man, like uh, yeah, the the, the, the probably competition's right. going to tick up. They're not going to go 54-0. They are going to lose a game. They are going to have a losing streak. Uh, whether it's two games or three games, you hope, I think they're good enough that they won't go on an extended losing streak. And we obviously know they're good enough to go on an extended winning streak, but it's baseball. There are ebbs and flows. The best teams in the history of the sport have had losing streaks. So it's going to happen. But I just feel like the way they're made up in all three phases, the the pitching, the defense, and the offense, makes it to where um, they're a solid club, man. Again, I'm not I'm not predicting a super regional host. I'm not predicting a top eight national seed I because we have to see them against uh, better competition on the weekend. It is it is coming, starting this weekend on the road. Um, this will be a great test for them. But man. The ceiling is so much higher than we could have ever met. I mean, it's. I tweeted about it after the after the game. Aslan, they were they they're coming off the worst season in program history, the worst, the very worst season, and then the next season they start eighteen and zero. Mm. Like, wh- how? What could? What else could you ask for? Like, and I asked Link about it after the game. Um, just like, does he appreciate? how the fans appreciate, can he appreciate what's going on right now in the fans showing up in large numbers and really appreciating his team? Because let's be honest, man, even the 19 team that went to Omaha, that was a tough watch. They oh, didn't yeah. run the base as well. They weren't a good defensive team. They would have stretches where they sh- they'd have games where they'd strike out 19 times as an offense. They got hot at the right time to get to Omaha, but that was not a good team. That was a team that barely made the NCAA tournament. It was a lifetime was- achievement prize. Which was well deserved for eleven. I was like, all right, your last well, probably, year, close yeah. enough. And then they, yeah. Yeah. they were the last and, four in. They were the, they were literally the last four in. Right. They barely made it in. Yeah. I think the NCAA selection committee chair said they were the last team in. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and they all knew it was his last year. So Leonard, go ahead and tell people it's your last. They'll let you in no matter what. Or that that um, Dan Munson guy from Long Beach State, coach. I mean, he might have the right idea. How about that guy? He gets fired, decides to coach in the conference tournament anyway, and now they're in the NCAA. They win the conference tournament. Yeah. That's crazy. Can they go back and extend them? <laughs> Are you allowed to do that? Well, I love um, after how they won the game. He, he admitted to, he's like, yeah, I'm not done. He's like, I, I want to keep coaching. So, you know, he's like, all right, they let me go. I'm going to take them to the tournament. But, you know, what? I'm still going to end up coaching even after this. So, oh like, yeah, double yeah. win well, by maybe, that guy. Maybe he'll coach uh, in the Final Four this year. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, but the point being, there has not been really good baseball played in Tallahassee in a good long while. Yeah. Um, and last year, obviously, it was uh, it was awful. The crowds showed that. The record showed that. But for the fans to get genuinely excited about this team to show up. Now the days were very nice, and it was nice to come out to the ballpark. But it was they were good crowds. They were loud crowds. They are invested in this team. Obviously, most of that has to do with 18 and 0. Like if you keep winning, more and more people are going to show up. But they do play well, man. Like I I brought it up to Link too. Not to pat myself on the back, but I will because Link afterwards said, hey, that's a good point. Yeah, no, so, uh, two days in a row somebody sent the YouTube comments, Saturday and Sunday, 
Link pointed out each single day, like, good question, Corey. So yeah. let's go, yeah. Corey. Let's go, man. My man. Appreciate Take it. Take that, oh. Brett. Take that, Brett. <laughs> Suck it, Nevin. <laughs> That's a joke. Brett's That's great. a joke, Brett's everyone. Good That's good but uh, yeah, so uh, so I I brought up Cantu, who still doesn't have a home run and still just absolutely terrorizes baseballs. He just doesn't mm-hmm. lift them in the air, but he hits the crap out of the ball. He just can't. Uh, he just hasn't gotten one over a fence yet. Um, he hits a, a one hopper back to the pitcher and is busting out of the box immediately. The pitcher thinks it's in his glove, and then when he looks for it, it's not there. It's behind him. He sees how hard Cantu is running to first. He is he is not lollygagging or jogging like most people would in that spot where you're mad that you just grounded out to the pitcher. He is busting it to first. The pitcher can't find the ball. When he finally finds it, because Cantu, is, he's faster than you think, number one, but he's running as hard as he can to first, the pitcher has to rush the throw. Well, he throws it by the first baseman. It goes all the way down the line. And a ground out to the pitcher turns into a runner at third because of the hustle out of the first baseman out of the box. And then the next play, I think it's the next play, Holbrook grounds one that the third baseman can't handle. Cantu scores, and there you go. That's the game-winning run. And it's all because that kid was running as hard as he possibly could as soon as the ball was hit. And he put pressure on the defense, he took an extra base, and they won the game because of it. And that's just, I mean, that's just good to see, man, because they aren't, look, as, as good as they played, they're not the most talented team in the country. They don't have a bunch of first-round picks. But when you play as hard as you possibly can and do everything the right way, you're hard to beat, and clearly, because they are now, uh, opponents against them are 0-18. So F- Florida State is hard to beat. Uh, they're not impossible to beat. Some losses will come, but man, when you play it the right way, when you play the game the right way, and you do the small things like that, the margin for error can be so small that that stuff really matters. And it did on Sunday. They beat mm-hmm. Notre Dame four to three, lar- largely because of the defense, and then Cantu busting his butt to first base on a ground ball to the pitcher. Well, I mean, this team, this program is completely different for the first time in forty-three years. Well, forty, you know, I mean, last year was Link's first season, but. Yeah. I mean, isn't that kind of I, I know that there's that there's always going to be maybe that hesitation for a lot of fans about this team and, and whatever success they've had and, and whatever they've not been able to accomplish. But like to see them fielding well and the way they run the base pass so aggressively and cleanly, like it, it almost feels like, you know, you're pinching yourself like this. It's too good to be true, but it's I man. This is what Link has done everywhere he's been before he got to Florida State. And for the first time in forever, I mean, there's there's a different voice. There's a whole different methodology to everything they're doing playing the game that helps explain why they're having the success they're having now and the reason they're having it now versus last year is because of all these new pieces they've brought in, obviously. I think I, I, think I touched on it last week, but how important it is, I wrote, the, I wrote a column about it. Like, no, Look, we all knew he was a good coach because what he did at Notre Dame, right, and what he did at UNCG before that. We knew he was a, uh, an accomplished coach, but his first season was awful. Yes. Um, so to come back from an awful first season, which nobody blamed him for necessarily, it was, you know, his best pitcher got hurt and he didn't have a lot of talent on that team. And when he took the job, the, the portal was essentially shut. So he didn't have a lot of time to put together a great roster, but as good as we thought he was, there was still plenty of people that were on the fence about him because he hadn't done it at Florida state, just like Norvell hadn't done it at Florida state. And so to start your next season out of literally you just had the worst season that Florida State has ever had. And so clearly people are going to be on the fence about you, whether they believe in you or not. And then to start the next season like this, you just couldn't ask for anything more. Not only do you have belief of the fan base, and I know you have 26 new players on this team, but they don't know how good this team is. They don't know how good they are. I mean, they, they believe I'm sure that they're good, but they don't know for sure. And if you start out, I don't know, man. 11 and 7, well, it could get sideways on you. If you lose a series early on, if you lose a couple of games early on, people might think, okay, well, Florida State's not all that good. Or the players themselves might think, yeah, we're okay, we're not great. But to start like this, to give your fan base so much hope, but to give your players not hope, mm. but belief, like real belief, that, yeah, man, we are really good. We're, we're one of the best teams in the country. You That turnaround that quickly – is uh is really impressive because again they have a they have a lot uh, basically a whole new lineup, but it ain't like they went and got uh Tommy Tanks from NC State, or other guys from these schools were all Americans. 
they got guys that were good players at other schools, but they, they didn't go get surefire, absolute, all ACC caliber, you know, Major League Baseball prospects. Right. And here they are, eighteen and zero, with one of the better lineups in the country. They put the ball in play. They struck out four times on Sunday. They just got unlucky, but they field, and they can pitch a little bit. And when they're going offensively, uh, they they are one of the better teams in the country. So yeah, man, I just what a what a way to sell yourself to a fan base that had been kind of depressed for the last decade, dec- fifth, half decade to decade, or just hadn't had a lot of great teams to cheer for. To show them, oh yeah, Florida State baseball can look like this again. That's what a what a way to start, man. They now they only got to go win, uh, what thirty six more games. Yeah, yeah, that's all. What would you be more surprised? Let's go to April twentieth. What would you be more? Twenty. Su- Why are you choosing that day, Nate? Yeah, just whatever. Okay, all right, just random. What would be more surprising if Max Williams has supplanted Diamez Ross full time at center field, or Jamie Arnold has now taken over the Friday night spot and is the number one guy over Cam Leiter? I think they'll keep. Uh, it would surprise me more the Arnold one um, because I think they like him on Saturdays either way. I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, mess with that. Arnold is. Arnold clearly so far has been your best pitcher. He's given up one earned run all season, and he just had struck out 12 guys in uh, five and two-thirds innings. Like, he was dominant on Saturday. I think he's your best pitcher. But what does it matter if he pitches Friday or Saturday as long as he's pitching? And theoretically, he should be facing a worse pitcher. So you have a you you have two aces is what what I think what I assume you think you have two aces with electric stuff, and you just one of them has to pitch on Saturday. So I, I would think he would stick. I think he, they're gonna they're gonna have Arnold go every Saturday, mm-hmm. um, is lo, you know unless something happens and there's an injury or something. I think I think Arnold is your Saturday guy. Williams in center man he again he didn't he didn't have a ton of hits on Saturday and Sunday but he hits the. But Jesus out of the ball. I don't know how else to say it. Thunderous left bat is how Link described it in the preseason. Yeah, I, I, and Link, you know what? I agree. Well, he, I do he, agree. He said Dinges has a violent, like it's violence. It's a fun yes. at bat every time he's up there. And he, he's, well, you saw that home run he hit on Friday night. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. And then uh, Jaime hit one into the parking lot on Saturday. Cam Smith hit one 448 feet on, on Sunday. And so did Ferrer. His was on Sunday too, but he also had one on Saturday. But that's just it. Ferrer is a guy you don't even really think about that much. Like, he's kind of lost in the shuffle a little bit because of Dangerous, because of Williams, because of Ferro, because obviously of Tibbs and Cam Smith. He's just Mr. Old Reliable that just happened to have the two biggest hits of the weekend. Yep. He had a two-run homer on Saturday. They won by two. He had a two-run homer on Sunday. They won by one. Mm-hmm. Like, he hit some – in the one on Sunday, he just pulverized that thing. Um so yeah, man, they it, that he's a they, they just they have a lot of dudes that can do it, and I'm just I'm telling you, can too. I believe in you, can do mm. because I know you're going to start hitting some bombs. You and they're going to go 500 feet when you hit them. He's just got a he's just so close to having like one of those weekends where he hits four home runs because he's due. And then secondly, here so Florida State is 18 and 0 right now. That's the second best start in program history. What was the best? Do we know? 2007, they started off 23-0. and Yikes. They didn't even make it out of the regional. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Way uh, to go, Buster. 2013 was second best. So they've, they've surpassed that. So the 2007 team started off 23-0. and They did not make it out of the regional, which they hosted. They were a national seed. The 2013 team was also a national seed. Uh, and they did not make it to Omaha either. They lost in supers uh, to Indiana. Shout out to Jameis, though. He came in uh, game two and had, like, I think, like, through almost two innings. Solid okay. relief. And they gave him that the was hook. against uh, Kyle Schwarber. That's correct. Was on that Indiana team. And then the one in 07 was Mississippi State. I don't know if any yep. other good players on that team. Mitch I Moreland, I, I think, was on that oh, team. Oh, all right. Yeah, so they lost to uh, they lost to Mississippi State. And then, uh, yeah, that Indiana team. And then the next year, 14, I think Florida State was a national seed yep. Jameis, after Jameis had won the Heisman. Mm-hmm. And then they dropped two in a row in the regional and were done. The freaking Alabama. Yeah. yeah. So all that said, I mean, I know you said you don't want to pencil them into a, a super, but. No, not yet. It's a little early. So Clemson then, at, at that point, can I then put some pressure on you here? Because I just, you know, man, we've talked about this now for 20 minutes today, and we've spoken about it probably combined hour and a half at this point of the season, man. 
you feel good about the starting pitching. You feel good about what they are offensively. They run the base paths really aggressively, but soundly. The defense is also sound. The bullpen has a multitude of options, granted unproven, but seemingly have not made any grave mistakes thus far. Like, what else you need to see to, to realize that, man, like like national seed kind of stuff is is a serious factor, especially when we're going to see them probably end up debuting in the top 15 today once these polls finally get released and updated. Yeah, no, let me put it, I guess I should phrase it another way, because I just talked about a Florida State, we just talked about a Florida State team that started 23-0 and and didn't make a super. Different coaching it, staff, man, different philosophies, different well, energy, Well, but it, the postseason is just goofy. That That's my point. I What I what I should say is I have no, I have no, um, I, I don't have any question whether they can be a top 10-ish team. Okay. Like you know, I I think I've seen enough there. They have the they're certainly better than I thought they could be. I don't know if they're the best team in the country. Again, they're, they're going to see some arms they haven't seen before, and they're going to face some offenses they haven't seen before. Let's see how they handle it. But I I I do think they have a potential of being a top ten team. I don't know. I, I just I would have to see them get Clemson. Do they play Wake? Do they play Duke? Like those are all those are three top ten teams. Um, and let's see how they do against those types of lineups and that kind of talent. But they're certainly better than I thought they would be. And look, I'm not. What I would say to that is, they could be a two seed in win Omaha. Like I'm just saying, over yeah. the course of a 54 game season, to get into one of the top eight seeds, you know, half of them are going to be SEC teams. More than that, maybe more than that. So they're going to have to have a, a, you know, to be a top eight seed, they're going to have to be like, I don't know, man, 41 and 13, 44 and 10. Like, they're going to have to have a great record because the SEC's RPI is going to be blah, 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 blah. So, um, them not being a national seed, me, me saying I don't know that they're a super regional, like a national seed host, doesn't mean I don't think they can get to Omaha. If you'd asked me a month ago or two months ago, I'd have been like, yeah, man, come on, just try to get to the NCAA tournament. I think I've seen enough from this pitching staff. If it stays healthy, quite frankly, those three guys that start, if they can stay healthy the whole year, um, and – because I, I believe in this defense and I believe in this offense. So the whole season to me about the potential of them potentially getting to Omaha um, hinges on those three the health of the three starters. The offense is good enough and the defense is good enough. And the starting pitching right now is absolutely good enough. It's just, you know, it's baseball. It's a matter of staying healthy. But, yes, they do have the potential – to get to Omaha, they have, I guess they have the potential to be a super regional host. I, I just think that, um, you know, let, let's 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 see how they handle this weekend. That would be a that's a very good litmus test. And look, if they get swept, I'm not going to sit here and say, "Well, they got no chance." Mm-hmm. It's baseball, man. Yeah. It's just baseball. They 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 could get swept and be awesome. Might be the last three games they lose all season, folks. Like you you just don't know. I I think I've seen enough though. Um, because they do the little things well, and they hit the ball, and they can pitch. That I'm, I'm, I'm more excited. How about this? I'm more excited about this baseball team and just watching them than I probably have been. Man, I don't, I don't know since maybe Jameis. Mm. That team was really good, or Devin and and James Ramsey and that yeah, team. Like, my twelve I, team they, was awesome. It's been a long time since I've been this excited and this encouraged by a Florida State baseball team. All right, so they got at Clemson. They've got. They'll be hosting Louisville at BC, hosting Miami at Wake at Duke. The yikes. NC State at home at Pitt, hosting Georgia Tech. That was a lot of information I just dumped at you folks. I probably should have just gone with the fact that looking at the current D1 baseball rankings for this week, uh, Duke is ranked sixth, Wake Forest is seventh, Florida is eighth, Clemson is tenth, NC State is 13th. Um. Is anybody else on here? Miami's not on there. Sorry, Miami. Sorry, Miami. So that's what they've got in store. But it's the ACC, right? Like they just yeah. played a team that was that is winless in the ACC, and they beat them four to two and four to three. So all these series are tough. All these games are going to be tough. They're going to lose double digit games. And I'm not like Corey. Quit being a Mister. Quit. Quit. Uh, kicking my cloud and crushing my dreams. It's just, it's college baseball, folks. The best teams in the country have double-digit losses. They are going to lose 10 or 11. I mean, they're just going to lose double-digit games. That's just how the sport works. But, man, what a great what what a great way to give you some wiggle room. Mm. It's a good way to give you some wiggle room where you can uh, you can survive a losing streak or a losing losing a series or two when you start out 18 and F and O and you're the only undefeated team in the United States. That's crazy. 
Good job, Link. Good job, buddy. And by the way, he's a he's about as no nonsense a human being. He's awesome. I love as him. I've ever met, yeah. I've ever talked to. Like yeah. he he just there he just doesn't nothing phases him. Um, he doesn't really smile. But he also doesn't – he doesn't scream or anything. But he's, he's just, warm. He, yeah. He, yeah, he is. But he's just so nonsensical. Like, no nonsensical. Like, just no no nonsense at all. I'm going to tell you what happened in the game. I'm going to answer your questions with conviction. I'm never going to break a smile or laugh or joke, and that's fine. Yeah. I am just all business. Yep. And he reminds me of Norvell in that way. Like, he's not the guy that uh, – you know, Norvell screams, how you doing? And well, how's everybody? Good morning and all that stuff. He They're does nothing before. alike. They're both successful, but they do it in completely different ways. But neither one of them, uh, yeah. neither one of them are, uh, they are, I think they're a lot alike in a lot of different ways and in, in the, the way, how seriously they take their jobs. And when they talk about things, when they're talking about something where they're not joking around and Blink never jokes around apparently, mm. but when they're not joking around, it is dead serious and they get to the point. And they are no, they are no nonsense, and they are very matter of fact, both of them. And you can see, I just feel like they run their programs that way. He is not, Link is not Mr. High Energy, but I think when you when you whittle away Norvell's crazy energy and get to the heart of who he is as a person, you don't laugh and joke around with him a lot either, man. I know, but he has that that facet of his personality. Like Link does not like those, all these newcomers talked about, like it's crazy. Norvell's exactly what he was on the recruiting visit as he is in February when we're doing tour of duty. Like he brings that same kind of crazy energy, but they see the different sides of it. I'm sure the players in the, in the clubhouse see that too, but man, Link, Link was put on this planet to coach a baseball team. And like, by damn it, like he's just going to yeah. stay on that, that third gear the entire time, man. And it's, it's incredible, man. It's uh, it's very uh, it's very refreshing, man. I like him a lot. I like Mike too. It's great. You got uh, and you got Brian Penske, and yeah. you got Lonnie. Um, and, we, and we like Leonard too. Let's speak about Lonnie real quick. Florida okay. State now eighteen and eight on the season. Uh, yeah. They lose their ACC opening series against Duke. Uh, they were um, they were able to bounce back on Saturday to set up a rubber match on Sunday. That went to extra innings, but uh, the Blue Devils uh, took it to them, won nine to five in eight innings. Uh, they're a fourth-ranked team in the country, Duke. So yeah. it wasn't Where'd like they lost. that come from, by no. the way? What's going on with Duke with the baseball and softball teams? <laughs> I know, right? Krzyzewski lost and everything else uh, opened up there. I felt like maybe McKenna Reed had tapped into something because I think Allison Royalty fell into trouble early on Sunday. I don't know. It's the fourth-ranked team in the country, so you're not going to panic. But clearly, uh, maybe the – I don't know. Is the bigger takeaway, Corey, the, the fact that the offense maybe isn't nearly as potent as we had hoped – uh, or the pitching staff hasn't coalesced and gelled, or it's March. Chill out, man. No, I, I look the the pitching staff. I said it last week. I'll say it again. This is not a this is not a top eight national seed. Clearly, um, they have McKenna Reed pitched really well on Saturday, and then came on in relief of royalty on Sunday, and pitched well until maybe the fifth or something. But then they were down five three in the seventh inning against the number four team in the country and came back and tied it. Yep. It went to extras, and then Ashton Danley, the hot shot freshman, the number two player in the country, uh, coming out of high school, uh, they they scored four runs off her, and they, they lost they lost the game that way. But uh, before that, I know that's like, uh, you know, kind of how was the other than that? How was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Like uh, before the four run not eight she gave up, she pitched well. And look, man, I just think when you look at this team, McKenna Reed is starting to pitch better. She looks like a lot like she did last year now, which is good. You need that. Nobody else is close to Sandra Cock, and it shows. That's how you go. That's why you're 18 and eight. Um, you don't have any depth of pitching right now. Um, Danley ha- is growing up and is going through some growing pains. Her ERA is over five, but it's coming. It's coming down. Um, McKenna Reed is is uh, her ERA has plummeted a lot. The offense is going to be fine. Um, it is fine. It, they just you know the the. They, they're pitching right now as we talk in the middle of March isn't good enough for Oklahoma City. It's just not. Not not for the not to the standard it's been here at Florida State. So you hope they can figure that out, but I don't know what you do. I, I don't know how you – I mean, they were down 10 nothing on Friday, Aslan. Again, I, wh- when does Florida State ever get down 10 runs in softball? And it's, been, it's happening multiple times in this game. 
or in this season. And they, yeah. they have multiple innings where they're giving up four or five runs an inning. Just stuff that you never saw, even when they're playing Oklahoma. Well, that's the, is the problem that they're allowing 10 runs or the problem they're not getting any runs across the, you know. The well, no, I mean, the five runs, and I know they, they scored their five after they were down 10-0, but five runs should be enough to win a division one, a high-level Division One softball game. And they did it twice this weekend and lost them both. And then on Saturday, they won 4-2. to two. Like, five runs should be enough um, when you're playing Duke. And it just isn't because the pitching isn't quite good enough. But, uh, um, you know, again, I, I, don't, I don't know what you can do. You can't go sign someone. Um, so you just got to work with what you have. McKenna Reed, I think, is turning into – like, her Saturday performance was good enough that you're like, okay, you got – at least that's back on track. She should be an All-American candidate. At least that looks to be back on track. But Danley and Royalty are just going to have to be better. Um, I don't trust any of anybody else. But I don't really trust those two, but I certainly don't trust the ones behind them. Um, but, yeah, if you only have one pitcher, and Lonnie loves to pitch a lot of people, that's what she builds her, that's what she builds her program around, is pitching a lot of arms, having a bunch of different pitchers. And when you only can trust one right now, that's an issue. When you're playing Duke. Now, look, the other way to look at it is you just played the number four team in the country. You lost the series two to one, but the the la the 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 rubber game you lost in extra innings. So you're close to being pre. I mean, you're you're a good team still. You're not terrible. You're not awful. You're a good team, and you're going to have a lot easier series. And you can go on a run and gain some confidence. They've just it's been a tough start to the season for them uh, pitching wise, and you hope they can find some confidence through the rest of this month in April, and then when they get into May, they can maybe make some magic happen, Aslan. Like the NC State basketball team did. Yeah, how about that? It's unbelievable. Uh, five wins in five days. More wins at the uh, whatever that arena is than the Wizards have had all season long. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Probably as many as they had uh, in at their own home arena against ACC teams. Anyway, yeah. I mean, they, yeah. Just not a, that was not a very good team all year, and then they go and win five games because, of course, they do. Vimeenergy.com promo code is Warchamp Bogo. That's Warchamp B O G O. Use that promo code, buy an item, get one of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. Awesome how that works. 12 shots in a box, so you'll get 24. Man, that would last me 48 days, everybody, because I take a half a shot, and that's all about I need. One of our guys out there, um, again, rubbing elbows with our subscribers whenever we hang out is always a cool thing, was Aslan. Let people know, some for a lot of us, half shot's probably good enough, so mm. you can stretch it out even a little bit longer. You'll still get plenty of hours of energy, I can attest to that, but seven hours when you take a full shot, 260 milligrams of all natural caffeine, and it's packed with vitamins because it's vitamin energy, vitamin and nutrients. Uh, you got vitamin C, vitamins B12, vitamins D, depending on which variety you choose. Can't go wrong with any. The flavors are great, and they all help out in different ways. The world's first clinically proven, clinically tested energy shot to not only obviously enhance your energy, but enhance your focus, better your mood, and eliminate brain fog. All from a little half shot that tastes pretty solid. How can you go wrong? Vimeenergy.com, promo code Corey. War Champ Bogo. Kind of want to talk about hoops, but we've gone about 40 minutes, Corey, and haven't talked about Already? football. Wow, yeah. all about baseball and softball. Sorry, gang. Lo hey, no, stop just apologizing. Know, I, They're well, really good. Look, but also, tomorrow's show will have talked to all the football coaches. Yes. And then. Wednesday's show will have actually seen a spring practice with all these new guys. So we're, we're very excited about all that. Should I spend time later today after we get done talking to Mike Norvell, especially coach Norvell and like compare his energy or his words or his mannerisms to what he did last year? Because I feel like I know Keon hadn't arrived yet. Uh, they obviously had not gone through spring practice because it was the spring the pre-spring luncheon, but I'm sure he felt really, really, really good in mid-March of 2023 about what his football team was going to be last season. Mm. So I wonder if it, will we be able to tell anything? Will we be able to glean anything uh, from the way he talks? Or is it all going to depend on the questions that we ask him? Because he's got so many new pieces. And I know he's done this before. Like he's gone to the portal. He's looked at the tape. He's evaluated guys and it's worked out. So it, it's not the first time he's had to do this, but it, it just feels different without Jordan being around, without the energy and the leadership of guys like Jared Verse and Kalen Deloach. Um, will we have a good idea for how confident maybe this head coach is for his team uh, by speaking to him for 20 minutes on a Monday after he's treated us to a free lunch? No. All right. No. Moving on, so then. I, I, but I, 
like there's nothing he can say later on today that will impact me at all or should impact any of y'all. He's going to be confident. He's going to say positive things. He's going to talk about how hard they all worked in the offseason. And all of that is going to be true, I think. I, or he's at least going to believe what he's saying. But, again, the, the real stuff comes on Tuesday. We actually get to see them on a football field. We get mm-hmm. to see them, what they look like athletically, not just in shorts. Well, I mean, I guess they will be in shorts. Yeah, yeah. But not just shirtless in shorts running around hula hoops. They're actually going to be doing football things on a football field. Uh, by the way, how do you think we're going to be able to watch practice? Because the one practice field has been torn up where the defense usually is. Right. No. So I don't – they probably won't let us in the baseball stadium because I feel like half no, they the team will, will – Read the emails, Corey. Read the emails. Um, I, but, but at so the conclusion ha- of the photo video period, media members will relocate to Dick Hauser Stadium for viewing the remainder of the practice. But they're not going to have 100 guys practicing on one football field. So half of them are going to be in the IPF, is my point. Yeah, we won't be able to watch that, which is going to kill some of you folks on the beat, but not this Well, game. that blows – well, I'm sure they'll cycle them out. Maybe they'll give us half and half. Nah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. And plus, on Tuesday, there's a baseball game at 5 against Stetson. That is a good point, so, though, Corey. Not, maybe I'm changing my mind. That Because if they keep the defense in the whole day, we're not going to be able to watch a defense, really, other than period three, which we know how important that is. But yeah, Well, I guess and you know, usually they go to that opposite field to do the one-on-ones with the DBs and the wide receivers. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and like, they, there's, no, uh, there's no far field to go to. So they're either going to do it right in front of us or they're going to do it in the IPF, and I assume we'll be walking down to go in the IPF. They're not going to just have us sitting out there not watching anything. So, And, again, this isn't a complaint. No. We get to watch practice. It's mm-hmm. awesome. That's why I've been looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to this spring more than any spring since I've been doing this uh, because of, number one, we get to watch practice, but all the new faces, all the established players that have joined the program, it's going to be fun to watch. Uh, but, yeah, going back to your original question, no, I expect Norvell to talk about how excited he is about the, the spring. A lot of guys have made strides and, you know, all that stuff. Do you have Do you have a question that, that's on your mind? Like, what's your one burning question? Or are you going to wait for him to say something and that's you – can't, you can't figure it out right now because he's going to have to say something that's going to lead you in the direction to ask him. Hmm. Yeah, no, I don't have anything straight away, honestly. I don't. Maybe, like – is there a chance this receiving core can be more productive than last year's? I don't want to say better because you just lost two NFL guys, but can they be more productive because of just the amount of bodies they have, um, the amount of talented bodies they have that they can throw at a defense? As opposed to last year, it was all it was a two-man show. And Ja'Kai, when those guys were hurt, and that was it. Is offense the, the biggest – burning question I guess and from a, a, a broader picture zooming out from there is is offense I mean I know it's 2024 and shoot it's been this way for the longest time ever since Joe Montana lit up the Bengals in that final drive in Super Bowl 23 I think quarterbacks finally really started being uh, fully embraced for you is it is it going to want to keep eyes on the offense is that what's going to either alleviate any concerns you have or end up being the big questions that you're going to have going into the offseason the way the offense performs in this spring yeah, you know, the the offense as a whole, sure, I, I do want to see what it looks like. But again, as I made the point, the offense at the end of last year wasn't great. Um, it wasn't nearly as good as we expected it to be, and a lot of that had to do with injury. Um, but it wasn't. It just wasn't like a juggernaut like we thought it was in September. It didn't turn into being that, and they still went 13-0. and So I feel like I guess my point is I don't know what I'll know about. I want to see how the what the receivers look like, but my my the offense is a big obviously a big question mark. I do think it has a chance to be as good or better than last year's because it, you know I just I think you might be more dynamic at wide receiver three through seven than you were last year. But I'm really interested in the D line. Yep, that's you know the the D line is like. Is there a chance this D line could be awesome, and we just don't know it yet? Like uh, you lose Braden Fisk and Jared Burst, you don't expect to still be and Fabian even Lovett. pretty good. Right. Fabian Love it too, but right. you know it's just so many new guys. Patrick Payton, we know what he is, yep. uh, but though he could get better, like he he could be a better version of Patrick Payton, which is pretty darn good. And then what all the, what about all these other guys? That's that I think is something we'll know. A little bit more at the end of, by the end of the spring, 
and then we'll obviously know before we head over to Ireland. By the way, um, figured out my trip, my plan to Ireland, mm. Aslan, the trip, flying into Manchester, England. Oh, nice. Then taking a train over my man. To, to wherever, the train, then a ferry to <sighs> Dublin, and then back to Manchester afterwards or London or something. We're going to do a little European uh, tour on the uh, Euro rail for a couple of days. That's maybe go to Paris, it. maybe go to Amsterdam. Okay. But we're flying into Manchester because we could get there. Otherwise, we weren't going to get there until Friday evening, which oh. would have sucked. Now we're going to get there like Thursday, midday afternoon. So that'll be better for everyone involved, I think. Wow, so you're showing up like right before the game pretty much and then staying a little bit after. Well, yeah, game. because somebody had to be here for practice because they won't be leaving. They'll practice a normal week, so they'll be here practicing Tuesday and Wednesday of that week. So I'll be here for that, and then after Wednesday's practice, we'll drive down to Orlando. Direct flight, baby. Didn't know Manchester was that big. I'll be honest Gee, with you. I didn't either, man. But That's it's big crazy. enough to apparently have two Premier League soccer teams that are good, right. but also has an international airport, and it has direct flights from Orlando. Huh. So uh, got a little a little wedding present, uh, business class ticket. Ooh. So daddy's going to I'll have Thanks, to take Ira. something. Well, yeah, right. I'll have to take something to knock me out, but then I'll be able to lay down uh, for the flight. And, uh, yeah, so we're flying into Manchester – Wednesday night, we get there Thursday morning. Okay. But, yeah, I had to be here for practice on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday since all you guys will be at the pubs uh, in Dublin. So after they're done with practice Wednesday, they're going to fly, and then they'll arrive there like a red eye? Like I think Thursday they'll fly. Morning. I think they come on Thursday, I think. I don't know. That's crazy. But I think they pre- – yeah, because I think they, they want to have like a real week, like a normal week, yeah. uh, you know, other than, you know, dro- flying, pl- flying to Ireland. Um, treat it like you're playing, uh, you know, Wake it's about Forest. the same flight as, uh, is Seattle, right? Yeah. Just yeah. in the opposite direction. Just maybe a couple hours further than Seattle. So just act like you are Hawaii. Just act like you're yeah. playing Hawaii. So I, I think they, I think they will fly out on Thursday, but I don't know. Maybe Wednesday night. We'll see. All right. We're waiting to get our assignments for which coaches we got to interview at the lunch, and we're going to speak to everybody, and we're all going to be spread out. So that'll probably dictate a lot of what we speak about in tomorrow's show. And then we'll show. overload our YouTube page. Yes. With all the so watch them all, folks. Do you want to hear how the how the coaches are excited about these guys? Watch all those videos that we we uh, we throw at you guys. Uh, starting what as lot about twelve thirty one o'clock today. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, well, that's when we'll get all. We'll you'll start seeing all those videos uh, flood the flood the page. Yeah, it's hard not to want to talk about the quarterback because he's a new guy, but you've seen him a bit. Yeah. And, you know, there's some stuff that, you know, left a little bit to be desired, or at least in terms of what relatively where you were at previously. Um, but I feel like that's that's going to be answered, though. I mean, that, that's the cool thing, right? Like I feel like we'll have a very good sense of just how comfortable he will ultimately be in the offense by the way he performs in these upcoming spring practices. It's not the, the final product. However I was going to say, but also, game. I don't think there's anything I could see through the first, for, through all of spring, but certainly the first couple of weeks of spring, where I'm like, oh no, this isn't going to work, because I remember Jordan Travis in the spring of 2022 didn't fill me with a ton of confidence, and then by, and I know he'd been in the system longer, yeah. but by late August of 2022, I'm like, well, wow, this looks different. The the point being, you we we can't judge him in a new offense with new not just a new offense guys he's never thrown to before. It's going to take some time. That's the beauty of spring practice. You can work out these kinks. You can learn. You can get on that learning curve with all these new receivers. So we know what he is, though, right? He is an enormous kid with a huge arm mm. that has played a ton of football. So no, nothing I see, unless he's just straight throwing it to linebackers two weeks from now four times a practice, there's nothing I can imagine seeing where I'm like, yeah, this isn't going to work. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I have all the trust in the world that he is going to be a solid quarterback in a good offense. You know? And that's that's what you're getting with him. You're not getting a Heisman candidate, I don't think. I, it may be awesome. I hope he proves me wrong. But you are getting, I think, a good college quarterback. He was certainly good last year. Wasn't incredible, but good. In a good offense. With what we think are real weapons out wide. But that, to me, is the bigger question than DJ, right? Well, who, who are these wide receivers? Who, who is he going to be throwing to? Who are the guys that are going to separate themselves from the pack? 
I guess that's fair because, you know, Ira pointed it out before everybody else, uh, just, you know, how, you know, the dearth of talent in 2021 out wide, how that was probably going to come home to roost at some point. And, you know, you just figure that, all right, you know, they're going up against their own cornerbacks. They know the routes they're going to run. They know their tendencies. It'll be fine when they play other competition, but it clearly was not the case, at least for the first half of the season. So I, I think wanting to see how the receivers are going to – evaluating them is going to be a very important part of this, and we'll probably have a, a good idea of where they're going to be. But haven't we seen so much from Jordan that we'll be able to see DJ through 15 practices and know whether, like, hey, man, like he's – He's just as good as we saw Jordan in these situations or like, you know, marginally, marginally not as sharp and crisp, which is to be expected or like significantly not as adept at knowing where things have to go and and seemingly making those right decisions. I mean, is that not something we'll be able to kind of take away after 15 practices? You know, what's weird about it, though, man, is that, you know, when we watch these practices, other than a handful of times, it's not like you would walk out of the field and be like, Wow, that was a, the offense killed him. The offense looked great. Jordan looked incredible. Now, at the end of his career, before he got hurt, um, I, I, he never threw inter, he barely threw ever interceptions in practice at all. But you know, there were practices where he was just on another level and they couldn't defend him. But there was a lot of back and forth. It was never like uh, the offense just dominated the defense and and Jordan Travis just lit up the defense. So I don't. I guess my point being. It's hard for me to know as a lay person to look at that and be like, he's got it figured out. He looks great. And I'm talking about DJ now. Yeah. Because in these practices, it's not like they put together extended drives. It's not like they have the ball for 12 plays and, and DJ's throwing 50 pa- passes against real defensive coverages. So it's hard to know in my in my brain okay, he looks really sharp, or okay, he looks awful. Because quite frankly, there were a lot of weeks where I was just like, well, that was okay about Jordan Travis. That was okay. That was fine. It was a normal practice. Looked good. And they ended up being one of the best offenses in the country. And I'm talking about 2022 specifically, or the beginning of 23. And that's So I don't know that we'll know what he is or isn't based on these practices. Like whether he's going to be awesome or just okay. I I don't know if that made sense or not. The the hard thing to – like I think we got a little bit fatigued because we trusted Jordan so much. It was Jordan. Well, it was, that's true. It was yeah. it was two years of Johnny. It was two years of Trey Benson. It was mostly you know the offensive line was obviously the, the big variable, but Jaheim Bell was a very accomplished tight end. So you know after a while of watching them perform, like yeah, I mean like they're veterans. They know how to handle it. Like it, it all looks the same shade of blue or whatever you want to call it. But I man, you got new quarterback. You got new running back. You got all new wide receivers. More locks moving into probably a more pronounced role in this offense and that offensive line is probably introducing two new guards again. So it, it just feels like there's so much more turnover this time around. There was a level of continuity, despite the, the whole portal King sort of reputation, there was a, a level of continuity going to last year that you had that they're oh, yeah. not going to have this time around. Yeah. I just think I, I guess what I was trying to say is I won't, I won't be able to make a, a firm decision on what the potential of this offense is going to be or what he can be as a quarterback based on these practices. No. That doesn't mean I can't say, wow, he was awesome today, yeah. or wow, that was concerning. Like, he, it, it, he's just not he's not clicking with these receivers yet. Uh, but the beauty is, is that it's March. Hmm. So he doesn't really have to start clicking with them until Dublin. So he's got they've got time. I just don't know that we'll be able to know if he's got it, even if he looks great. Well, if he looks great, then we'll know, right? But then the yes. – the, the flip of that will be oh, what's defense. wrong with the defense? Yeah, yeah. yeah, why can't they cover these guys? But I, I think, I think there might be some up and down moments, and it looks up and down, or it's choppy. And but it still doesn't, it doesn't mean that he, they're going to be choppy during the season. Like, look, Jordan Travis did throw interceptions in practice. He never I did mean, in a game. Yeah, Wait, well, he throw two, but he would throw, he would throw an interception occasionally in practice. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, I'm not saying that. What we're about to see doesn't matter. It matters a lot. I I just, with him specifically, unless, again, he's just throwing it straight to people's chests, safeties or linebackers, I, I think I'm more interested in uh, – I, I, I trust that by Dublin, he will be comfortable enough in this offense to win a lot of football games. I'm If the wide receivers can start to stand out. I do, I do want to see that. I want to see the wide receivers win these battles. They're going up against a good defensive secondary, in my opinion. 
I want to see these wide receivers step up and look like real playmakers because they did kind of have get-out-of-jail-free guys with Keon and Johnny that I don't think they have this year. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to get open, and they're going to have to win jump balls that quite, and 50-50 balls that, quite frankly, really none of the receivers on this roster have ever done at a high level. So, but they're all, they all, they're all, it's their chance. The, you're up. Mm. Next, it's y'all's chance. Get up on the stage and let's see what you can do. And that's what I really look forward to is who of the wide receiver core will stand out. I trust DJ will, will get enough of those guys the ball if they're open. Who is Who are going to be the guys that get open consistently? Mm. We'll know soon enough. We'll know soon enough. We'll also know uh, soon enough who is the national champion of men's collegiate basketball. The NCAA National Tournament starts on Thursday. Make your plays over at mybookie.ag. When you sign up for the first time, use the promo code WARCHANT. You'll get an instant cash deposit bonus. As we record this show, uh, lines have not been released for the games. Obviously, these are tough to digest, so they've got to start uh, hacking Florida away State at Florida State did not shows. make it. Hmm. We should let people know. Florida State was not selected as an at-large team. Thanks, Boo Corrigan. The women were... But in transparency, we record this before the, that selection show, so we don't. Maybe Aslan, you could add something at the end. Absolutely. Yeah, to let us know where the women where the women wound up. But they they were selected. Well, I shouldn't jinx it, but they absolutely better have been selected to the NCAA tournament. But as I'm talking, we don't know where they are yet. Anyway, go ahead with the read. Sorry, Aslan. Not a problem, my friend. Uh, we don't know lines, but I'm going to give you a couple. Uh, I don't want to call them truisms. Listen, I had a, a great slash bad weekend. Um, I did a whole bunch of like five game parlays, Corey, like just putting five dollars down okay. just to have fun. Those are fun. Yeah. I won one of them, so that was cool. Okay. And then the other two, I went four for five, which is like, oh, and I no, know it's just worse. You'd rather go zero for five. Yeah, but like, so my whole thing is, and I told my friends, I'm like, I'm gonna pick the parlays. You guys just need to identify one of the games you don't like, and then we'll change that one. So. I'll pick some games out later this week. But anyhow, I was going to say, whoever's playing the Big Sky champion, feel free to take them in the points, but they're one of the playing games. That's Montana State taking on Grambling. But if Montana oh. State were to win, uh, feel free to go ahead and, and bet against my Bobcats. Big Sky just doesn't do well. Uh, they don't cover mm. either. Okay, that's uh, good to know. I watched the Yale Brown game. Um, I know madness is madness, but I feel like I think they got Auburn. So, I mean, Auburn's probably going to get a dozen and a half. I wouldn't be scared about giving out a dozen and a half. They'll probably be that one kind of runaway game. And then Mississippi State has Michigan State. Mississippi State's got some of that San Diego State leftover parts to their construction mm. from last yeah. year. So um, maybe take the under on whatever the line is for Mississippi State and Michigan Do you know State. Mississippi State's last NCAA tournament win was 2008? No, no. Why? It's crazy. Why? Did it's you just think crazy. I, no, I just saw it flash across the screen. Yeah. That seems like a long time. That used to be a pretty good program. Yeah. It's been 16 years since they won a tournament game. They anyway. made the Final Four in 99, I want to say. Um, yeah, they, yeah. Were, they had a good little run there, the dogs. But uh, anyhow, they're back in there. So what do you feel about the ACC teams real quickly, Corey? It is a read after all. Are you buying into NC State? They're taking on Texas Tech. Big 12 teams have been really, really good this year. I feel like NC State at this point legitimately has nothing to lose. <laughs> and I would like to – I think they're going to play loose in that game. So I would like them in that game, but I, they're just not good enough to, I don't think, to keep winning. I guess I'm wrong. I could be wrong, but I feel like I like them in that game against the kind of average, mediocre Texas Tech team um, because they, they're there with no – just them being there is icing on the cake. So it's kind of like, well, here goes nothing. I can't believe we're here. This is the craziest run any of us have ever been on. Let's just go have fun and see what happens. And that's a fun way to play basketball, kind of loose and carefree. So I like them to win that game. All right. MyBookie.ag. Again, that promo code is WarChant. Instant cash deposit bonus. Promo requires $50 minimum deposit and rollover requirement of one-time deposit total, including your bonus for withdrawal. For full terms and conditions, visit MyBookie.ag slash about dash us. Quick interruption from Aslan from the future here. Uh, that is relative to the Aslan you've heard. Most of the show, uh, this is from later in the night. The bracket's been revealed for the women's side of things. The Portland Four region will have the Florida State Seminoles in it. Nine seed Knowles taking on eight seeded Alabama. That game will be played in Austin, Texas, because Texas is the number one seed, and they will get to host um, those first few games of the tournament before it heads to a conventional 
regional setup. So Texas, the one seed taking on 16 seed Drexel, Alabama, the eight seed Florida state, the nine seed Alabama has got a pair of seniors that are good to quite good. Eli and I, Sarah, Ashley Barker averaging 17.2, 14 points per game. Alabama finished the season 23 and nine, 10 and six in the sec. They lost their opener in the sec tournament. So they'll, they'll nearly had a week off before they played Florida State. Florida State, meanwhile, dropped their game in the semifinals of the ACC tournament. They lost 69-43 to to NC State. Uh, The Knolls making it to the tournament for an 11th straight time. So that's awesome. Alabama, they haven't made out the first weekend since like 1998. So good vibes for the Lady Knolls. If they were able to beat Alabama, they would then take on Texas again. Texas, the number one seed, we assume that they would beat Drexel date and time for that game. Not announced, but the first round games will be held March 22nd and 23rd. And now we go back to previously recorded content all the way out. Corey, it's already been an hour. Want to make this quick, great article slash column. Actually, you know, it was a column from Irish Ophel over this weekend yeah. about what to do when it comes to Leonard Hamilton, uh, this coming season here, if he were to remain with Florida state, he'd be in the final year of his contract. A lot of coaches don't like doing that. I don't know how much leverage he has None. to get a contract extension. Um, and, and Ira does a really great job of kind of unfolding all the options and how neither of them are, are seemingly palatable. I said this in the group chat with you and him, though. I, I feel like this is kind of an easy decision if you're Florida State. I know Leonard doesn't want to go out and on a season that was similar to last year, um, and there's no guarantee they'll be better than this season, especially if they lose Jameer Watkins. Don't you put all the pressure on Leonard if you're Michael Alford? Pretty much like, listen, we, we can't give you an extension. If that's not suitable to you, it's been a great run, man. We appreciate it. If you want to come back for this final season of your contract, that's cool. We'll also give you like, you know, 25% more resources to invest into player acquisition to help you go out on yeah. top so you don't have that fear of of being in the lurch without anything to help you. I feel like that's probably the best middle ground. I, I can't imagine who would say – if Leonard was like, I want – all right, I'll, I'll leave after this year, but I want more money to put together the best team possible. I don't think Florida State would say no. And at the same time, I think if Florida State's like, we won't give you an extension, but we'll give you a little bit more budget to help yourself be better this upcoming season, I don't think he would say no either. Yeah, I mean, going back to your original sentence, no, he has no leverage. That, that Nobody's coming to try to hire Leonard away, and uh, Florida State would be like, look, man, this is your last year of your contract. If you, I assume if he quits because they don't re-up him, then they don't owe him any money. Um, yeah, you so quit. He, you quit, you don't get any of your money. Yeah, yeah so yeah. he would want to coach out this last year. He doesn't want to give up whatever it is, $2 million or thereabouts, um, because his, his earning power is about to cease whether it's this year or next year or the year after. I mean, he's, he's not coaching very much longer. So, yeah, he has no leverage. And, I look, man, I, I just think, um, yeah, I, it was a good column by Ira. I, I would recommend everybody reading it because he's right. Like, Florida State, you don't want you, – you don't really – it's not really the time to fire him because you got so much other stuff going on. You don't want a national search for a college basketball coach. That's the last thing you need right now. But you also don't want to just be butt-ass average in college basketball for the foreseeable future either. So there has to be a decision made, and it has to be kind of quick because of, you know, quite frankly, the age. It, well, the age and the uh, the program. I mean, it's been bad for three years now. So I think it's fair for everyone involved to say this is the last year of your contract. We know you can't recruit like this with one year on the contract because how are you going to get anybody to sign with Florida State when they don't know who the head coach is going to be? We get it. Recruiting class for 2025 – Will not be a good one, folks. But I I think there needs to be some sort of plan in place, whether it's announced or not. I hope it's announced where there is a coach in waiting or some sort of succession plan for when Leonard is gone. I I, I mean I, I I guess it really doesn't matter with the portal. Um, high school recruiting doesn't mean as much as it used to, Correct. honestly. Yeah. So maybe you don't even have to have a plan in place, but you do announce before the season that this is Leonard's last year. If he agrees to it. If he doesn't agree to it, and this isn't sarcasm, and I'm not being snarky, it is legitimately have a great day. This was These last two decades, thank you so much for everything you did for the program. But we are not giving you an extension. We're not re-upping you. We can't. Well, you saw the crowds at those games. No. Just from a cost-effective analysis, we can't re-up. You're, this is it. So cost-benefit. No. Cost-benefit, sorry. This is your last year. 
one way or the other. Yeah. So let's make it where we announce it's your last year and you can have your goodbye tour. And it would be really neat, just me thinking about it out loud, it would be really neat for whoever the last home game of next season is that it's a – I don't care if they're 10 and 20 or they're 25 and 5. The, it's a, it, it is Leonard Hamilton's last game at the Tucker Center. And it is a sold-out crowd. And before the game, they reveal that it's now Leonard Hamilton Court or mm. whatever they want to do. Like, there are things you can do yeah. to make this a really neat – exit for him as he begins the next chapter of his life and you begin the next chapter of your program. Otherwise, it's going to be messy. If he says, I need an extension or I'm not going to coach, I just don't think he has that leverage. I think you say, well, then you're not coaching, man. And we'll go hire. We don't want to do this right now, but we will go hire someone right now. We're going to go, well, I guess we got to do a search. I know, but they, but thank you, Leonard. But they, if they fired him, you know, no, he would say, look, I'm not, you know, that that was always the threat that these coaches and agents made forever. I'm not saying Leonard is that person, but that's the threat they've made forever. My coach needs a four year extension so he can recruit my co- My guy needs an extension so he can recruit. I'm not coaching under with a with a one year contract. I'm not doing it. That's been said for decades now. Well, that, he has no choice. Yeah, he's under contract. Yeah. So he, he would he would for quit. one year. He yeah. either coaches yeah. or he quits. You know what I mean? So. uh, uh so, but yes, he won't be. I don't think they'll fire him. I don't think that's even on the table. Yeah, but I, no. you know, I, I think he could say, "Well, I don't want to coach if it's, this is." I just want it to be a good exit, and I want him to say, "I'm. This is my last year. Announce it. Let him have his going away." All right, and the last thing, uh, not tangentially, but I guess maybe directly related to that. Like, I mean, if you're the head coach in waiting, you 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 leave the NBA. I mean, like Luke Lauk, Sam Cassell, like they walk away from the NBA to, to sit on the sideline for a year and shadow Leonard because they know they'll get the head. Yeah, yeah. If you're guaranteed to be the head coach at Florida State, yeah, it's yeah. more money or at least similar money. I, I assume there's no. I, it's definitely more money for Luke, and I assume it's the same for Cassell. They're not making two million dollars a year to be assistant coaches in the NBA. So yes, you would do that. Plus, you'd like either one of them or whoever if you had the opportunity to to learn the program. To learn college basketball, to learn recruiting, to learn portaling, all that stuff that comes with it. Um, and look, I don't know if that's realistic. I don't know if they'll have a, a coach already picked out. Uh, they could. Um, but more than anything, whether you have somebody already in place or not, you give yourself a full year to figure out who it's going to be. And you give him a nice exit. You just give him a nice exit, man. I, I just think that would be – I just think that would be – that's what he deserves – um, it is not life and death when it comes to Florida State basketball. If they suffer through another mediocre year, you're not losing a ton of money that way. It's not like football where it's the lifeblood of the university or at least the athletic department. So you can afford another mediocre year, but you also could have – who says they don't go to the NCAA tournament? And that would be a really neat way for Leonard Hamilton to go out. But either way, I'd like him to – I know it's not his own terms. We all want to work until we're dead. But it's, Speak it's for sort yourself, of, brother. Well, you're right. That's a good point. Yeah, a lot of us want to retire. But we say that, but how are we going to handle retirement, right? That's Aslan? true. Yeah. You and I are just going to be – we're going to have to talk an hour uh, an hour a day just, just to do it. We're just going to be missing it so much. So I, I, so I, I just want to – I think it would be great for all parties involved. Or the best case scenario is he agrees that it's his last year. They announce it's his last year. Whether they have an announced plan in place, a succession plan or not, just we know it's his last year. We can concentrate on that, and he can get the flowers he deserves for the person he is, the career he's had, and what he's done at Florida State. That's that's what I want to happen. By the way, um, you saw my tweet about. I don't know if I did or not. The, the Florida basketball team still made the tournament, oh. even though their center almost broke his leg in half. That's crazy. I I would have thought the selection committee would be like, well, no, that's a, that's a very important person you're missing. You don't get to make it, Florida. But they, they allowed Florida uh, to get into the tournament anyway. Thankfully, I have not seen a replay of that injury because it must have been horrific. Hmm. Did you see it? No, I had the TV on, but I wasn't paying attention. Then I noticed it was like dead quiet. I'm like, what's going on? And the kid was down. I was I thought it was like another cardiac yes, event or right. something, but it was orthopedic. Yeah, Clearly, yes. it was. Uh, I think he broke his leg, and he broke his leg or ankle in which blood was on the court, <laughs> if that tells you how gross it was. Um but what was funny is I told uh, I told somebody that was in the Florida State press box, one of the beat writers, uh, that I'm like, oh, I wonder if they'll let Florida in the tournament. And he goes, ah, that's funny, but I don't think I would tweet that. And I go, well, too late, I already did. <laughs> and, 
And then, uh, and like, I don't know, two hours later, he's like, "Have you are your mentions still on fire or whatever? <laughs> and I'm like, buddy, I don't ever check my mentions. And how could they be on fire? All I said was, it's I feel awful for the kid, and I feel really, especially now since his team won't be able to make the NCAA tournament because of his injury, which if you're a Florida State fan or associated with Florida State, that's that's Kirk Herbstreet's position. You lose an important player because of a grotesque leg injury. Sorry, gang, you don't get to compete for the championship. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, college basketball doesn't work that way. One word answer, yes or no, Will Wade. No. What if McNeese beats Gonzaga and then beats Kansas, makes it the Sweet 16, Will Wade? No. All right. You can't go from – I know you said one word. You can't go from a person like Leonard Hamilton. Can you, though? To, I guess you're right. Maybe. I mean, hey, well, I mean whatever. What, what about the Dave Bliss? Is he still alive, the co- <laughs> former coach at Baylor? Just anybody that can get you some dubs. <laughs> Check out WarChant.com <laughs> and our YouTube channel. Uh, around lunchtime, noon, we'll have interviews with Coach Norvell and literally all the assistant coaches. Jeff Cameron Show, 1 to 3 o'clock as well. WarChant.com, your ultimate sports source. Thanks for listening to Wake Up, WarChant, presented by the Corner Pocket Barn Grill.